Hello, I'm Shel Nymark. I made the Rosalie Doolittle Fountain at the Albuquerque Botanic Garden. This presentation is a version of the talk I gave to the Albuquerque uh, Public Arts Board on January 17th, 2023, as they prepare to vote to demolish the fountain. I feel like it's important for the people of Albuquerque to know what they're losing, so that's why I made this presentation. I also help it, hope it's helpful for other public artists to understand my process and especially for ceramic artists. I hope that it's helpful for the Botanic Garden and the Public Arts Board to understand uh, where they went wrong and why this is happening. In 1994, I was chosen to design and create the Rosalie Doolittle Fountain for the new Botanic Garden being built as part of the Albuquerque Biopark. It was my first large public art project. There would be $50,000 for my work and $100,000 for the city to build the forms, do the cement work, and buy and install the fountain infrastructure. I was shown drawings of the circular plaza area and told that the fountain couldn't be more than two feet tall. They wanted a clear view of the gardens from the plaza. I thought it would be a big challenge to design a low fountain that would still have impact and drama. Because of Albuquerque's historic connection to Spain, I decided to go to Spain to look at fountains. The first place I went was Barcelona to Gaudi's Park Güell. He used 19 shades of white tile, which gave his work a richness that it wouldn't have had had he used only one shade. I took that to heart. When I made 4,000 tile cottonwood leaves for the fountain, I varied my glazes in each kiln load. Probably it has hundreds of colors. Colors fading into each other has always been an important part of my work. Up till this point, I mainly used airbrush and sprayers to accomplish that. In part way, I noticed Gaudi's mosaic style on this window, brown fading into white using kind of a pixelated idea. In this exquisite glass mosaic in Barcelona, green fades to purple and then back to green. Resolana, literally a place in the sun, connotes a location where people hang out and chat. I try to incorporate it in all of my public work. The curving shape of Gaudi's bench in Park Gway encourages people to face each other and therefore fosters Resolana. Gaudi's tower at La Sagrada Familia. I loved how he used these different chunky leaf-shaped tiles to construct vines. In this mosaic in Sevilla, I saw how one shaped tile could be used to create a repeating pattern. At the Alhambra in Granada, there were a lot of fountains that were beautiful, low, and dramatic. Many, like this one, had a bowl within a bowl, and I decided that's what I would use for the Rosalie Doolittle Fountain. When I returned, I started drawing plans to present at a series of meetings with a committee. It included Gordon Church, Albuquerque's public art director, who was a wonderful mentor for me, director of the Albuquerque Biopark Ray Darnell, lead landscape architect Pat Westbrook, and several other stakeholders. The first drawing had more elements than we would use, including connecting a stream coming from the bench to a stream they were building in the park at the upper right and a water fountain at the lower left. Other ideas we considered and discarded were this bridge and this leaf pattern based on the mosaic I had seen in Sevilla. My first drawing for the bench used real boulders and ceramic cottonwood leaves set in between them. I finally decided on a design for the bench that would feature New Mexico's wild garden on the back of it, the cultivated garden on the front of it, and the top would feature a stream that represented water coming down from the mountains to water New Mexico's gardens. The wild garden would be represented by choya and prickly pear cactuses, datura, and buffalo gourd. They would be built out of plant parts, kind of like the leaves on Gaudi's Sagrada Familia. Like Gaudi's benches, this bench would be curved to help promote Resolana. I also hoped to promote Resolana with the shape of the pool. The floor of the pool would be 18 inches below ground so that people could comfortably sit on the edge of it, 
put their feet in the water on a hot summer's day. The bottom of the fountain would be tile flagstones with tile cottonwood leaves looking as if they'd fallen in between them. Cottonwood leaves are the symbol of the garden. My first drawing for the inner bowl included birds and the second one included branches, but I decided to simplify. The colors of the cottonwood leaves would go from autumn yellow to spring green to summer green and back around the fountain. I included red catkins that come out on the cottonwoods in the spring in the spring green leaf area. Worked with a ceramic engineer to develop a frost-proof clay body. Then I started testing glazes. They came out great on the small tiles. Unfortunately, when I put them on a larger tile, they all bubbled, so I had to start from scratch. Since I had to make about 4,000 tile cottonwood leaves, a friend helped me build this tile press. I could press out about 10 an hour by hand in about 60 with this press. This is my assistant, Paula Seaton. Tiles were carved by hand and then molds were taken of them. The larger tiles were pressed out by hand. This is my assistant, Irene Smith. Flat tiles were rolled out on a slab roller. Edge tiles were simply bent over the edge of a table. Trim tiles were squeezed out of an extruder. I drew the design for New Mexico's cultivated garden on a 50-foot roll of paper. I laid the paper out on top of wet tiles that were numbered and traced the design onto the tile. I drew the plants for the mural at the farm of my neighbor, Eremita Campos. This is basil. Strawberries, lettuce, onions, eggplant, broccoli, garlic, corn, chili, tomatoes, raspberries, beets, bell peppers, and melons. The larger picture in the center is Eremita's farm on the banks of the Rio Grande. It's bounded by apple and peach branches drawn in her orchard. I expressed my concern to the garden that minerals would build up on the tile from the water. Roman fountains who designed the pumps said they could install water softeners for a few thousand dollars. I asked the garden to do that, but they said they couldn't afford it. Landscape architect Pat Westbrook, who was wonderful to work with, told me that they would clean the tiles every week if they needed to. I started working on site late spring of 1996. First, I drew the shapes on the ground to be dug out by hand. The crew decided to bring in the backhoe instead, and they made a huge mess, which added a lot of extra time. I supervised the building of the forms. Rebar was bent with simple homemade tools to create the shapes I wanted. Metal lath was tied to the rebar to hold in the cement. Cement called shotcrete was blown into the forms with a kind of fire hose, then smoothed out with trowels. I extruded the pieces for the top of the fountain in my studio and brought the tiles wet to Albuquerque to form directly on the fountain. I numbered them and brought them back to my studio to fire. I made some three-inch wide pieces to fill in the gaps because the clay shrinks. They were designed so that the water would pour over the edge of the fountain in elegant sheets. Here I am setting the first tile, building these Datura plants out of plant parts, probably about 20 different shapes of leaves, flowers, and buds. Rubbery coating was painted on the fountain to seal it. Albuquerque artist Aaron McGinnis was one of the many people who helped set the 4,000 cottonwood leaves. Other volunteers came to help, like these women that I didn't know. This is my friend Jane Padberg from Dixon. She brought her two sons, Chris and Jesse, who were teenagers at the time. They worked harder than any adult men I know. Because the spaces between the tiles was so large, the grout manufacturer told us to grout with thin set. It was the hottest June on record, over 100 degrees every day, and the thin set dried on the tiles really fast. It was a nightmare scraping it off. Setting the edge tiles was tricky. We used a board and a level to make sure water would flow over the low places evenly. We set the bent tiles on the bench first and included some bent cottonwood leaves to look like they'd fallen there. The stream bed on the 
top of the bench was prepared with a layer of cement. Then I started setting ceramic and real rocks. About the time this photo was taken, the head of the biopark called me into his office on a Friday afternoon. He said he didn't like the ceramic rocks and wanted me to pull them out and make blue tile to replace them. I told him it would cost about $2,500 to make the tile, which is the amount I would charge any customer for that many square feet of handmade tile. He said there was no more money and that I should just go into my studio and make them. At the time, I probably wasn't even making $5 an hour, working two years, buying materials, and paying assistance. I also told him that the concept of water flowing down from the mountains was important to the piece. That was the piece I was contracted to make, I asked to go before the arts board, who, along with him, had approved the design. He said no, and that if I didn't do it, I would no longer have help from the crew. I said my contract required them to assist me, and he said sue me. When I came to work Monday morning, a representative from the crew came and told me that if I was even caught talking to them, they would be fired. I'd been working with these people for months, and I considered these guys my buddies. Hiring people to do the work the garden should have done probably cost me about $2,000. This is my assistant, Paula Seaton, and volunteer Kay Weiner, both from Embudo. Though she never got to see the final fountain, I presented the design to Rosalie Doolittle a few months before she died. She requested that her beloved roses be included in the project. I drew these roses in Edomita's garden and made this dedication plaque for her. It took over six months to install all the tile. Plastering the bench around the wild garden tiles was really tedious. But in the end, I thought the results were well worth it. The water was finally turned on just a week or two before the garden opened. The way the water flowed over the purple trim tiles in graceful sheets made me so happy. The whole project exceeded my expectations. Destruction of the fountain began a few days before the grand opening of the garden in December of 1996. I was told that a worker ran into this Datura flower tile with a bobcat. It's in a prominent place where a walkway intersected with the fountain. The garden never asked me to replace it. This photo was taken 27 years later. When I visited the fountain late that spring, it was a lively place. Kids were putting twigs in the stream on top of the bench and watching them float down. Minerals had already started to appear on the tile, and when I asked Dale, the head of the garden, if he could clean them, he said they didn't have the resources. They had planted chemisa in front of the dedication plaque and some of the wild garden tiles. They were already being obscured. Many years later, at about the time this photo was taken, I noticed that some of the purple trim on top of the fountain was deteriorating. I think I knew what the problem was, and I wrote a letter to the garden offering to replace it for free. I was told that the head of the biopark didn't want me working on the property and that they would hire somebody else to do it. They replaced the edge with random colors of tile and curved it so the wa water would no longer flow over the edge in graceful sheets, but instead flowed down the wall of the fountain, hastening deterioration caused by caustic mineral buildup. I went before the Albuquerque Public Arts Board. I restated my offer to restore the fountain for free. I brought along about five books that the fountain had been published in. Vara, the Visual Artist Rights Act, is stronger when a work has been published. The Arts Council refused to look at the books, and they voted against me restoring the piece. Imagine restoring a painting, and this is essentially a painting in three dimensions out of clay. The artist had a purple line running through it, but your restorers painted in random colors and shapes. Would that be acceptable? The head of the biopark is who he is, but the Arts Commission's job is to advocate for the art and the artist's vision. I hope that the Albuquerque Public Arts Board will never treat another piece of art or artist like this again. In the preceding years, whenever someone would tell me that they saw my piece at the Botanic Garden, I would be embarrassed that they would even think that I would design something that looked like that. 
In addition to being an aesthetic disaster, the restoration was done poorly. It didn't last. Tiles fell off and they were not repaired. This allowed water to get behind and loosen the adjacent tile. The mineral buildup is really caustic and also led to a quicker deterioration. You can see how thick the mineral buildup is here. The fountains and tiles of the Alhambra that inspired this piece are about 700 years old. They've been restored many times over the centuries. They are a true legacy for the people of Spain. The Arts Commission in the Botanic Garden couldn't maintain this piece for even 25 years. They have totally failed at the people of Albuquerque. This cement cube honors the people who donated money to make the Rosalie Doolittle Fountain a reality. I'm grateful that their support gave me the opportunity to make this piece. It was one of the greatest honors of my life, and I hope the people of Albuquerque really got to enjoy the piece while it was there.